my goodness. I am so excited to have you on the Success with Soul podcast, Vasavi Kumar. Oh, gosh. Okay, first of all, let me just take a breath because you know how much I love you. Um, you. For the listeners, Vasavi and I go back, um, oh gosh, 2023, we go back a couple of years now. Vasavi was my business coach. I was in her mastermind and I am a huge fan and I am so proud of you. Um, We're going to talk a little bit about why I'm so proud of you, but welcome to the show. Let our listeners know who you are and um, all the good things. First of all, Indra, thank you so much for having me here. We do go back uh, and it's always a pleasure to reconnect with people that I've worked with and, you know, who, you know, when you reached out and was like, you know, come on the show, I'm like, oh my God, yes, I love that. And then when you told me that you were going to be the one interviewing me, I'm like, well, this is a trip. So <laughs> I love that tables have been turned, right? Cause I interviewed you on my podcast yes. um, back in the day. So this is great. Um, so who am I? I am the author of the book, say it out loud. I am a speaker. I am a host and I am first and foremost, someone who really has dedicated not only her own life, but to help the lives of others um, be able to assertively communicate who they are, what they do, what they stand for uh, in a very bold way, because Lord knows we don't need any more watered down people, people who package their words. We need more rawness. We need more realness. We need more unfiltered uh, communication. And that's really what I've been committing in my own life to do and practice and also help other people do in their life as well. Yeah, I love that. So Vasavi, tell us a little bit about your journey towards finding your voice, right? And getting into this creative spirit. What were some challenges that you faced along the way? Well, I got to be honest. uh, I've been sharing my voice since I was a kid. In fact, it's the thing that I got in trouble for the most. I, I actually do not have a story that's like, oh, I've always been a really silent person and I found my voice at this age. Like, no, I've actually always used my voice as a kid. It's why I got in trouble when I was a kid. It's why I got hit when I was a kid. It's why I got yelled at when I was a kid, why I was called disobedient when I was a kid, why I was so misunderstood when I was a kid, because I have a very unique ability to call out the invisible elephant in the room. And I was not afraid to do so as a child when I would listen to and watch my parents argue and I would see my mom emasculate my father and I would see my father shut down. And as a child, you know, we pick up on things very quickly as children because we are highly sensitive and we are pure and untainted to all the voices around us. And we see things and we feel things so clearly and so purely. And so I was that child. I'm the, I'm the youngest in the family. And I would say to my mother, you can't talk to him like that. And when my dad would stonewall my mother, I'd say, you gotta, you gotta say something. You can't just you know, ice her out. I didn't say ice her out, you know, but you know, at at, at that age, I could see my mother was frustrated with my father because she was not getting her needs met. She didn't know how to communicate it. My father just took whatever my mom threw at him because I think my father had this like uh, persona where he just thought, you know, I'm just going to be a, I'm I'm just going to basically be a doormat to my wife because, you know, she's been through so much. So I'm just going to put up and take it, you know, and just take it. But as a child, I was like, wait a minute, this is not right. You know, you people don't talk to each other like this. I knew that from a young age, but that's what I got in trouble for. But as I got older, Indra, where I did silence myself, just like my father did, I silenced myself in relationships, in romantic relationships and partnerships. So I actually played out what I saw growing up in my own romantic relationships. In my business, um, and I think many of your listeners can relate to this. I think I never wanted to be misunderstood in my business. I have a very bold way of communicating. Anyone who knows me behind closed doors know that I'm extremely unfiltered and I'm unedited. Um, I don't package my words. What I say is what I mean. And what I mean is what I say, but I, in my business is where I also started to realize and notice, man, I am not being as bold as I can be. So, you know, what I really want to say is it hasn't always been easy to be this queen of saying it out loud. I've gotten in trouble for it. And being acutely aware of that and still having a little fear around being misunderstood. That's always my my greatest fear is I'm going to be misunderstood. And so as a result of being or or fearing being misunderstood, 
I had to look at where in my life if am I not being clear in my communication. And so that's the journey that I've been on. And that's now what I um, help people with, you know, but it started at a very young age where I, you know, would say it out loud all the time. Um, so I started reading your book. I pre-ordered, say yes. it out loud. And there's a, there's a word that you say that your mom used to tell you, and I'm not going to even try to pronounce it. I, I will say it. She would say to me, so first of all, the way you say my name is Vasavi, my family calls me Vachi, uh, because when I was born, my sister couldn't say my name Vasavi. She said Vachavi. So they called me Vachi. But my mother, when I was a kid, would say Vachi, Chumare. Chumare means shut your mouth. Close your mouth. Chumaira, be quiet. But I didn't listen to my mother. Um, I rarely listen to her. I still don't listen to her. She's not the boss of me, even though I think she thinks she is. But yeah, my 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 mom all the time would say to me, Chumaira, be quiet. Close your mouth. Yeah. So as you know, this podcast, most of our listeners are actually female entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what what are some ways that what are some tips that you can share with our audience, getting them comfortable to talking to themselves, saying those things out mm -hmm. loud. What is the power of saying it out loud? The power of saying it out loud is that you release whatever is inside of you. You say it out loud. Like, so if you're just talking to yourself out loud, you're saying your thoughts out loud. When you keep everything inside of you, it just becomes this narrative, right? You can't really separate the truth from these other voices. And my ultimate goal is to help you tap into the voice that really has something important to say to the world or in that moment or whatever situation. But that voice is often drowned out by the other voices. And so what often comes out of our mouth is some watered down, bland, basic version of what we're really trying to say. So when you actually say out loud, unfiltered and unedited, what you're thinking, what you're feeling in real time, and you do that and you listen to yourself, you can immediately say, you can immediately tell whether you're bullshitting yourself or not, because words carry vibrations and you cannot lie to the body, no matter what, okay? No matter how disconnected you think you are or you may be, you still cannot lie to the body. Your body always knows. But because we have become disconnected from ourselves and our bodies, we have people walking around this earth just being split from themselves and conflicted within and living a very dualistic life, right? What we see out there and what we're really feeling on the inside. So when you say it out loud, Indra, you can transcend that ego viewpoint. Um, the part of you that's scared to say it out loud. You're like, oh shit, I can't say this out loud. I can't let other people hear this. But I want to encourage you to say the thing that you really want to say out loud. I'm not telling you to post it on social yet. I'm not telling you to hit publish on it yet on your podcast or your blog. I am asking my reader, I'm asking my listeners right now, the thing that you really want to say, like take a look at your marketing copy, take a look at your sales pages, take a look at how you're coaching your clients, take a look at how you're writing your emails, take a, take a look at how you're communicating and ask yourself, is this the realest version of myself? Is this really what I'm trying to say? Is there even more potent truth that can be drawn from this? And experiment with yourself and ask yourself, how can I say this to sound even more like me? Right. And the way you find out, does this really sound like me or not, is that you have to say it out loud. And what you're going to find is the bolder you are in your communication, it's not going to feel comfortable at first. OK, because even though I say I am bold because I am I'm pretty damn bold. Right. There, there's not much that I will not say. Even to this day, when I say certain things, my body's still getting used to my boldness. It's like, oh shit, can you really say that? Are we going to get in trouble? Are we going to get hit? <laughs> Are you going to be a bad girl if you say this? Are you going to get canceled? You know, and I have to train my body and I have trained my body through my own self-soothing practices, which I talk about in the book, different ways to soothe yourself and regulate within. I have trained myself and my body to be okay with the vibration of my bold words, right? My body feels safe when I say things a certain way in a way that's more, uh, pleasing to the person's ear. Oh, this feels safe. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to uh, have our clients fire us. We don't want people to unfollow us. This feels safe. But I like to push that edge, right? I like to see how far can I go? How much more honest can I be? How much more real can I be? And I'll tell you this, we, we got to really look at what's the narrative in our head that's keeping us from being bold. So for me, I never wanted to be like my mother. 
Never. I thought she was a bitch. She was a bitch to my father. I mean, I would straight up say to my father, why are you still married to her? She is a bitch. And my father would say, she's gone through so much in her life. It's okay. So my dad was a classic enabler, classic okay, okay. enabler. I just want to pause for a minute and just say that your father's name is Shanti. Yes. He's the epitome means- of peace. Peace. Exactly. Yeah. So he really was the embodiment of peace. He was the embodiment of peace. But now I was like, no, you're more like people pleaser peace, right? You're not actual peace. That's people pleasing, right? That's people pleasing. So I became like my father in my own way. So the thing that we don't want to be, the person that we least want to be like, we end up being like them. We end up internalizing parts of themselves and it comes out. So I never wanted to be like my mother. I didn't want to come off as bitchy. I didn't want to come off as harsh. Um, and so I watered myself down, but that part of me that I didn't, I didn't want to be like her. She was still in me. She's still in me. That harshness is still in me. I internalized a lot of my mother's voices. And so I hurt myself. I would, I was never harsh with other people. I just turned that voice towards myself. So you know how people always say like, oh yeah, you got to be your biggest cheerleader. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm like a combination of both, right? I'm both the cheerleader, but I'm also that cynical, discouraging coach screaming at me from the sidelines, telling me how I'm not farther along, how I should be making more money, how I should have a bigger following. So I have both, right? I, I, I internalize both my father and my mother. And eventually, and I think a lot of us do, we internalize the adults in our life, thinking that their word is gospel, their voice is gospel. And the work that I had to do was to find the voice of Vasavi. I'm still working on it every day, every day, because I'm, I'm 40, right? So think about how many of the voices and the programming that we have that has shaped who we are today. So it's still a a growing process for me. As this book has come out, I have become more bolder. I've become more uh, 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 apologetic. And the thing, the game changer for me has been now when I post something, now when I say something that feels like, ooh, edgy, I don't, immediately question it anymore. And I don't immediately think, oh my God, am I going to piss somebody off? Ooh, was that too much? I really do trust that bold voice within me now. Um, But like I said, there are times where I'll push the edge just a little bit, just to see what it feels like. Feels really good. Let me tell you that right now. It feels really good when you're even more honest. And it's not about being harsh. It is not about, uh, you know, shock value. It is about finding that voice within. And what does that voice sound like for you? My bold voice will sound very different than your bold voice. In the, but at the end of the day, my goal with people is finding that voice. You don't need to sound like me to be impactful or to be bold. We need to find your flavor of bold voice, right? And the only way you do that is by saying out loud, saying it out loud and actually hearing your voice, right? How can you actually figure out what that voice is if you're keeping it all inside? And that's why we need to say it out loud to ourselves or to somebody else. Yeah. Um, and so why would anybody want to talk about like their triggers out loud? Okay. So in my chapter, I talk about talking to your triggers out loud. We live in a society where we are groomed to just share what is acceptable and what is pleasant, right? Let's just talk about the pleasant stuff. So in this chapter, I talk about emotional perfectionism. I did not coin that term. Dr. Annie Hickox did. Emotional perfectionism, I'm going to paraphrase it, is basically some emotions are easier for you to display than others, right? So my sister is emotionally perfect. love her to death, but she will show uh, agreeability. She will show um, pleasantness. You know, she'll always be pleasant. She doesn't really let people see when she gets pissed off. She doesn't let people see her irritability because she too, like me, does not want to be like my mother. So my sister is very good at being like composure at all times. Okay. She's also on antidepressants. Go figure. Right. So the more you suppress and hide from the outside world, and even with yourself, the more sick you're going to feel inside. Okay. And so The reason why we need to talk to our triggers out loud is because so many of us are not willing to say, this pisses me off. I'm irritated by this. This bothers me. And we don't allow ourselves to acknowledge the shit that pisses us off. Guess what's going to happen? You're going to be in that situation over and over again, because you have yet to be honest with yourself 
I don't like this situation. I don't want to be around this person. I don't like the way my business is set up. So I'm going to give a perfect example. Your audience maybe can relate. I have done one-on-one -on -one therapy and coaching for over a decade. I'm over it, straight up over it. I'm just, I'm going to be straight up. And that, and that's maybe a very bold thing for me to say, because there's one part of me that's like, shit, there could be people listening to this who want to work with you one-on-one. -on -one. You're leaving money on the table. Don't say that. But that is the real truth. I have no desire to work with people one-on-one. -on -one. I have maybe four clients one-on-one, -on -one, love them all. You know, what would be awesome if I just ran one signature group program. And that's what I'm doing in this season. I have a training program uh, starting in August, Bold Voice training program. It, that's a big move for me to basically say, this is my signature group program. One-on-one -on -one is like, nope, join my group program. When we are not honest with ourselves about the things that do not feel good, we will continue to be in those situations and continue to live that life, that situation that we're just not happy in. So we have to allow ourselves to say the things that trigger us, right? And what, what has triggered me in, in, the, in the recent few years, and it's taken me a pretty long time for me to actually acknowledge, I don't want this anymore, right? But because I had those people pleasing tendencies, of just like, okay, I'm just going to keep it as it is. It's fine. I don't want to rock the boat here. I don't want to, I don't want to lose money. I don't want to do this. We stay in these situations. So you have to allow yourself to say, this is bothering me right now. I don't like this right now. Be honest with yourself. Talking to your triggers and talking your triggers out loud boils down to you being honest with yourself of what's bothering you. Stop saying I shouldn't be mad about it. Stop saying I shouldn't be bothered by it. Stop saying I'm fine with it when you're not. And that's what I did. I said, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. Oh, the money's good. I'm okay with it. No, I'm not. I'm not okay with it. I'm tired. I'm tired. I don't want to do that anymore. So you got to allow yourself to say what you don't want anymore so you can attract and receive that which you really do want. I love the attract and receive. I know you do. I know you do. <laughs> I know you. So yeah. <laughs> how do you balance like authenticity and vulnerability while still like maintaining boundaries and, you know, even privacy. I know that you're on social media. So how do you, how do you balance that? Yeah. I mean, for me, it is, um, so I use social media for my business. I market, that's it. I do share some personal stuff, but there are things about me that nobody on this earth knows. There are some things that are just for me. There are things that no one will ever know. And that is just for me and my golden retriever, Lainey. She is the only person who knows. There are certain thoughts that I will never share out loud. There are certain opinions that I will never share out loud. There are certain ways about me that I will never share out loud, not because I'm ashamed, but because you don't deserve access to my vulnerability. You haven't earned that right to know that about myself. If I'm going to share it with someone, it's going to be someone that I have a relationship with, that I feel safe with, that has earned the right to hear what I have to say. So we have to really look at social media and use it with intention. I use social media to market my business, to promote my products, to promote my book. I also use it to connect with my audience. And so I pick and choose what I share, not because I'm ashamed, but because you haven't earned the right. You haven't earned the right. I don't, you're not, you, just because I'm on social doesn't mean you get to have access to me. Just because you've read my book and you've shared a few things or you've listened to my podcast or you heard an interview doesn't mean you have access to me. You don't own me. You know a little bit about me, but that doesn't mean you have the, I have to tell you everything. That is, for me, that, that was the hallmark for me growing up, even with my own mother, right? I used to lie as a kid a lot because I was, um, I was afraid. My, you know, my mother would hit me if she found, I mean, I, we, we, got beat as kids. I got beat. My sister didn't get hit. I got beat when I was a kid. You damn straight. I'm going to lie. You kidding me? I was protecting myself. And so I um, lied because I was afraid and I was ashamed. Um, but I became more honest, you know, through my sobriety when I had to go to rehab twice, the way you stay sober is by being honest, right? My honesty um, is a direct, my, my sobriety is directly related to how honest I am. So going back to your original question, I want everyone listening to know this, that just because you don't share something doesn't make you a dishonest person. You can be vulnerable, you can be authentic, but that doesn't mean airing every single bit of your dirty laundry. Not everyone needs to know. For me, it's always like, what is the point in sharing this? What am I seeking? Am I seeking something? Am I tying this into a les lesson? Am I doing this just because 
I need some validation. No, I'm not going to put that on social. I have a therapist for that. And I know how to talk to myself. So I, I don't need the world to know that. So I just want to give everyone permission. Some things are just yours and that's okay. That doesn't make you inauthentic. I love that. You know, you speaking of your sobriety, I don't know if you've uh, read Matthew Perry's new book. No. So he, you know, he has been in and out of um, uh, rehab. Yeah, for years. And one of the things that he says in his book is that reality is an acquired taste. Mm. yeah uh sobriety is an acquired taste um mm. but anyway just in you speaking about your sobriety so tell us what your book is about in two minutes or less in two minutes or less my book teaches my readers how to talk to themselves you know you have those books that give you journal prompts and then you journal it and okay, fine. So you go from your head to your pen onto the paper. So I actually give you verbal prompts. You don't even need one of those expensive ass journals. Okay. I mean, if you want to write notes, that's great. I do have a few mini exercises where you write, but I ask you to speak them out loud. Everything is spoken out loud. Even at the beginning of every chapter, there's a verbal prompt. I say, answer this out loud. So my book in two minutes or less teaches my readers how to talk to themselves. At the end of every chapter, there is an exercise. I give you prompts. I give you scripts on how to talk to yourself. No one teaches us how to talk to ourselves. We are told what to do. We are not taught how to think. I am teaching my reader to think for themselves and to treat themselves with more kindness, with more love, with more respect. So many of us have been disrespected by people and then we disrespect ourselves, and then we are our harshest critic. Congratulations, we all are. But my book is helping you rewire the way you speak to yourself and I believe that because our words carry vibrations, that we have the ability to emotionally regulate when we learn how to verbally regulate. So I'm teaching you verbal regulation. I believe that the sound of our voice has the power to soothe us. Think about when you're anxious, Indra, do you want to be spoken to harshly and with absolutely no softness or do you want to be talked to with some softness? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's the same thing with ourselves, right? When you are, I have a client, she was voxering me and she was like, I'm so mad that I'm sad right now. I go, well, how's that going for you? You're mad at yourself for being sad. How is that going? And, you know, we dug a little deeper and she was like, you know, my mom never had any space for me when I was sad. It was my sadness made her angry. She said, my sadness used to make my mother angry because she couldn't handle my emotion. I go, yeah, well, welcome. You've just become your mother. You're now being a bitch to yourself. You can change that. You can change that. You know, in, in the world of like self-love and self-help, it's like, it's become this thing where it's become way too fucking expensive. Excuse my language. Ice plunges, saunas, gotta do this. Lymphatic drainage, drainage massage. You gotta spend all this money to love yourself. It's like, can we just start with how we're talking to ourselves First and foremost, do that first and tell me how you feel, right? So for me, the most underutilized tool. And I think also often overlooked, like we don't, people really don't talk about self-talk. They talk about it a little bit. They talk about self-talk a little bit, but like, no, it is a game changer because it is the words that you're thinking, the thoughts that you're thinking, those voices in your head are constantly there. And you, not only do I ask you, and I want you to be aware of what you're saying to yourself. I also want you to be aware of how you're speaking to yourself. Tone matters. It's not so much of what you say. It's how you say it. So it's it's really, you know, and it, let me tell you something, Indra, it's going to feel so weird at first, okay? Because in the most recent year, I will say, since my book has been, you know, I, I wrote it, marketed it, put it out. I've had some, it, it's been hard, right? Because I, I there's a lot of growth that's been happening behind the scenes and it's not pleasant. Like, I'm not going to act like it's all pleasant. Growing is not pleasant. It has, wasn't pleasant for me. I'm breaking through patterns. I'm breaking cycles. I'm, I'm, I'm stopping cycles. I'm talking about things that my family would probably rather have me not talk about. And that is not comfortable because no one wants to feel alone. No one wants to feel like they have been disavowed from their family, you know? So I've had to be very encouraging with myself, very kind with myself, just like I am with my clients. Why don't we extend that to ourselves? So it's been a little weird. I'm like, oh, 
I'm really being nice to myself. I'm really being like super patient. Yesterday, I had this moment, Indra, where I was working on my thank you speech. Um, you know, I'm having my book launch party. I, I know by the time this releases, it'll be like a month or so, but I was writing the thank you speech for my book launch party. And I was, I could feel this like engine inside of me. I could feel this pressure. I was pressuring myself to hurry up, get this done, get this done, get this done. And I, I literally said out loud, Vasavi, can you just chill for a second? Can we like have some fun writing this talk? There is no need to be this pressured. We have plenty of time. And that felt really good because I do not extend the same patience to myself that I extend to other people. I'm a Taurus, so I am naturally very patient. I'm a very patient person, which makes me an excellent teacher. This is why I'm such a good trainer with other people. When they make mistakes, I don't get upset. I go, come on, let's try it again. I, I got all day. You know, I, I remember I had a teacher back in the day. She'd be like, hurry up. I don't have all day. I'm the opposite. I'm like, I have time. Let's go. But I don't give that to myself. So yesterday I was super patient with myself and it felt good. And it did feel slightly uncomfortable because we have deadlines. Come on, we got to finish this. Let's go. And I'm like, nope, I am not going to pressure myself. I am going to give myself the gift of patience. We do not need to be revved up to get something done. And so even just saying that out loud, Vasavi, chill. You got to chill, girl. Like having that real ass conversation with myself felt really, really good. And so in those moments, you know, you got, you got to be acutely aware of what's running you. What is running you? What voice is running you? For me, pretty much my whole life, Indra, the voice that has run me has been faster, faster. Come on, come on. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Anxious, anxious. When you grow up in a chaotic house, you learn how to fight. You learn how to flee. And that's how I've run my life pretty much my whole life. Come on, let's go faster, faster. Figure it out, figure it out. You know what it's like to live with that voice? It's not fun. Burnout, exhaustion, wanting to give up, want to burn everything down. And so I'm in a season where I'm like, how much more patience, how much more patience can I have with myself? You know? And when I'm patient with myself, I slow down. I'm kinder to myself. I'm less irritable with myself. And as a result, I'm more kind, patient, and more accepting of other people, period. The conversation that you have with yourself, number one, will directly impact the conversation and the quality of conversations that you're having with the people around you. That's it. Oh, I love that. Can you say that again, please? Dude, that was in the moment. I don't know if I'm oh. gonna remember that, but let me say it again. Let, let, let me try to say it again. Uh, when you change the conversation that you're having up here and I'm pointing to my head, you will connect with depth, integrity and realness out there, period. Yeah. You change the quality of the conversation that you're having up here, you will change the quality of conversation that you're having out there. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You because don't know they, this. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I just, uh, um, I, I'm doing astrology now. Oh my God. I, I love that. Love that. Yeah, I'm yeah. an astrologer. And one of the greatest gifts astrology has given me Vasavi is that I realized that all that Virgo in me and all that perfection and, you know, the way I speak to myself, I'm so much kinder. And you'll like this. You'll appreciate this. It's not tennis, but I, I am a pickleballer now. Oh, I don't know if we could be friends in that. You know what? It's okay. You want to be a, you want to be a wannabe tennis player. No big deal. You go ahead and play your little racket sport on this little court. Okay. Go ahead. No, just kidding. You know, I oh. had to give you shit. I had to give you shit. Oh, well now you're going to really give me shit when I tell you that I pulled my calf muscle and almost needed surgery playing pickleball. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's not fun. <laughs> That's not fun. I'm no, sorry. No, that was not fun. But I, the, the point of that is that when I first started playing pickleball, you know, and I would miss a shot in mm. my head, the way I was speaking to myself is not the way I would have spoken to my son if he had missed that ball. And right away, you know, I would be so much more gentler. And I, I and I saw that the minute right. that I would be like, it's okay, don't worry, you'll, you'll do better. But like, in my body, I felt like a little bit more relaxed, yep. less tense. And um, I definitely credit astrology for that. Just mm -hmm. realizing how much of that Virgo in me really impacts that self-talk. Um, so I agree 100% with you. 
Vasavi, this has been amazing. We're going to get to the part of um, this conversation that I personally love. At the Success with Soul podcast, we have a lightning round. Oh, I love these. I, I, I don't, I, and I don't know the questions, so let's go. I'm ready. Let's go. Okay, so what's your favorite way to make time for self-care while running your own business? Mm, okay, I cook three meals a day. Every meal is a vibe. Every meal is a vibe. Um, whether it's my breakfast and how I plate it, whether it's my midday lunch, whether it's my dinner. I mean, it's a whole freaking vibe, especially at night. Cooking. So I cook three meals a day. I could easily afford a private chef. I choose not to do that. It's my way of slowing down, using all my senses to come together to produce this beautiful work of art, which I'm going to eat. And when I cook, there's jazz playing. There's John Mayer playing in the background. You know, we, we just get into a vibe at night. I'll put on my ambient lighting. I'll put on, you know, I'll, I'll light an unscented candle because I don't like smelly candles when I'm cooking. And I'll make my food. It's a whole thing. And, and as my food is getting ready, I'll clean up the kitchen as I go along. So after I eat, I just have to wash the one plate that I've eaten. It's a whole thing. It's a full body experience. I don't have time to think about other stuff. I'm in the moment. I'm cutting my vegetables. I don't use measuring or anything. It's very intuitive for me cooking. And I, I did also go to culinary school, but, the, but the, that's not even why I'm such a good cook. I'm a good cook because I love to eat. I love to eat and I know what tastes good and I know my palate. I know how much salt I like or how, how little salt I like. I know how much lemon I like. Like it's just, it's all about me and <laughs> it's nourishing myself. And it's truly the greatest act of love to be able to cook for yourself. I went to the grocery store and I'm sorry, I know this is a lightning round, but no, I just want to no. say this. I love it. Such a the, Taurus. You are a, fully the Taurus. I really am. I mean, yeah. any man who, any man who dates me next, I mean, I literally, I, I cook for the ones that I love. I cook for the ones that I love. And if you do not tell me that my food is good within the first 30 seconds, you're done. Like, I'm, I'm, I, I can't, I, I cannot be with you if you're literally chomping away and I have to ask you, how is the food? Like that, that's like a, that's actually my next uh, standard for me in my next relationship. Last guy I was with, I had to ask him. And I'm like, I shouldn't have to ask you. You should be telling me like right away. Like that's the thing, as a tourist, yes. Thank you for knowing that. I went to the grocery store the other day I saw this whole section of just prepackaged meals made by the people. And the, and I get it. Some people are on the go, but I'm like, man, this is what our society's come to. Like, you need someone to cook for you. Like, you, like no one has the time to get groceries, to, to figure out what they're going to make, to cut their vegetables. So you don't have time to do that for yourself. You know, it's, it's a thing for me. Also, culturally, you know, food was huge for us growing up. So we ate every meal at home, every meal at home. So it's just, you know, that's important to me. To yeah. Do that. Yeah. I'm just going to throw in there that you're also a Food Network star. Yeah, I was. Oh, I just want everyone to know this. My, my father, who I love more than anything, he's been hit with this awful progressive neurological condition. And uh, he was such a good cook. My father would cook with such gusto. I would be driving home from school. I, I got my master's at Columbia in the city. So we lived on Long Island. I'd call my father and I'd go, I'm so hungry. He goes, what do you want to eat? And I go, I want this, this, and this. And he goes, how many minutes till you get home? I said, 36. He goes, okay, I'll have everything ready for you when I come home. My father would have food ready for me. So I, I grew up with a father who served me. Like look, my father would wait on us hand and foot. So uh, when I was in culinary school, I was on Food Network on a show called Food Truck Face Off. You can actually buy it for $1.99 on Amazon Prime. So you should watch it and you can see my father, what he was like. He's a, he's a beautiful man. Yeah. yeah, love that. Yeah. Okay, what's one tool or strategy that you use to help with time management? Um, I only do three big things a day. So in my journal, or I'm sorry, in my planner, I have obviously my schedule, like the calls that I have to have, whatever. I'm very good at managing my time. If I have, po when I have pockets of time, I knock out stuff that I got to knock out. I don't dilly dally. So I always have like a top three and then I have like many other to do's. Right. And so I just don't waste my time. Like, you know, between a certain time period, I know when to shut off. So basically from like 11 to four is when I try to get all my stuff done, you know, go to the post office, go do the, you know, and I have my clients. Some days are less client heavy than others, but I really only stick to doing three big things a day. And if I can't do all three big things, it's fine. I work very well with deadlines as well. So I'm very good at organizing in my mind. Is this an urgent? Is this urgent? Do I need to get this done right now? Or can I get it done in 72 hours? So not everything is an urgent, urgent matter for me either. So I know what, what I need to work on and what can wait. So that also has helped. Yeah. 
what's the most powerful business mindset entrepreneurial book you've ever read? This is the one that you reference again and again, and it's made the biggest difference in your life. Oh, that is such a good, well, I'm going to say how to win friends and influence people. I know it's an oldie, but you know, if you don't know how to talk to people, I mean, that's going to really, that's going to really set you up for not success in your business because whether you are marketing yourself on social media or you're just out in the world, you never know who you're going to meet. And if you have blinders on or you're afraid of people, you are missing out on opportunity. You are missing out on connection. Some of the most amazing things that have happened in my life have just been when I'm out in the world, I'm not trying to network. I don't, I don't look at like, oh, this is a great networking opportunity. I don't look at things like that. Like, no, this is a great, I'm just connecting with humans. I'm just myself no matter where I go. So some people call it strategic networking, but the greatest strategy for me is learn how to talk to anyone about anything, whether I'm at a red light and there are these guys who are new in recovery and they're trying to collect money, whatever. And I never have cash or change on me. I always roll down my window. I say, bro, how are you doing? I'm four years sober from cocaine. How are y'all doing? He's like, God bless you, whatever. And then the, and then the light will turn green and I go, he's not helping me out in my life, right? He's not a network connection for me, but being able to talk to someone who can't do shit for you, who's just standing there in the middle of the street, that is a skill. So don't ignore people because you don't think they can do something for you. Not everything is about what can be done for you. While I do think you need to look out for yourself and ask yourself what's in it for me, the greatest skill you can learn is how to talk to anyone about anything. It also gets your head out of your ass. You know what I mean? Because a lot of people grow up in a bubble and they're sheltered. They're afraid to talk to people who don't look like them, who don't sound like them. You're really leaving opportunity and connection on the table. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I love Dale Carnegie. I mean, I, I mean, it, I, it's an oldie, but it's like, I mean, at the end of the day, isn't that what really matters? Yep. How, to, how, to, how, to, how to relate to anyone about anything, yeah. you know? So absolutely. Yeah. yeah. What's your favorite quote, mantra, affirmation for when things get tough and you feel like giving up? So it's two things. One is it's always going to work out for me. Everything always works out for me. Abraham Hicks, everything is working out for me. Love Abraham. Oh my God. You can literally yeah. YouTube anything related to Abraham Hicks. Yeah. Abraham Hicks spiraling into anxiety. There's a video for that. Abraham Hicks can't get over my ex. There's something that, I mean, literally Abraham Hicks plus you will find a solution. Everything's always working out for me. And then also my favorite movie, Shawshank Redemption, get busy living or get busy dying. So oh, that's wow. That's a blast from the past. Yeah, man. Yeah. Okay. And then finally, you're on the Success with Soul podcast. So what does success with soul mean to you? Success with soul means to me that I am leading with my values and I'm not just leading with what I think I should be doing. I am leading with my core values, period, and the soul of who I am. And that's different for everybody. So what I value in life is connection. What I value in life is quality of experiences, what I value in life is knowledge, knowledge of self, knowledge of others, curiosity. And so when I lead with that, everything follows, everything follows, success follows. Um, also the quote that my father always said, I, you know, I asked my dad, how do you make money? My parents did, you know, pretty well for themselves as immigrants. My father always said, I don't chase money, service first and the money will chase you. Focus wow. on ser focus. Yeah. Service first and the money will chase you. You know, we have to learn that the hard way in your, in my twenties, I was all ambitious and I, you know, I got, I loved the money so much, but I always had, I always have had a service heart, servant heart. But what I want to say is, and everyone listening, you know, the coaching industry has become a tainted. It's become tainted. And I remember when I first became a coach 11 years ago, it was not like this. It was very much like people with a servant heart. But then what happens, you, you, you have people who just make all this money and then it's all about making the money, making the money, making the money. And then we, and it's all about the funnels and the SEO. And I'm like, I don't give a shit about any of that. Did I help you today? Did I help you today? Are you better off today than you were five minutes ago before you met me? That is what I care about. I'm not saying don't care about the SEO, don't care about the funnels, but that is not your number one priority. And that is, if that is your number one priority and you're not feeling fulfilled, then you maybe need to ask yourself, what are you leading with? What's fueling you? Are you being fueled by the bottom line? Or are you being fueled by your values? So I have had massive fluctuation in my income in the past two years. And for me, I realized I was not leading with soul. What I, I was leading with what I thought I should do. And I was out of integrity with myself. 
right? It wasn't like out of integrity with my clients. I was out of integrity with myself, but as a result, then you become out of integrity with other people. So now in this season, I am doing very well because very well for me, according to my standard of what I want for my lifestyle. And I truly believe it's because I'm a little relentless these days about, no, if I don't want to do it, I'm not going to do it. I would rather have a dip in my income than keep doing things that I have peer, that I have consistently said I don't want to do. It's been hard, right? Saying no to 10 grand up front is hard. It's really hard. It really is. But it's even harder to hate yourself, you know? And I'm, I'm kind of done hating myself and not respecting myself. You know what I mean? So for me, it's really important that we stay true to our values. I love that. Vasavi, this has been amazing. Thank you. Please let our audience know where can they connect with you? Where can they find you? So the first thing, by the way, this is the first time I've ever said this on the podcast. I kind of made a rule that if anyone wants to work with me or join my groups, you have to order my book. You have to read my book because self-talk is the foundation of everything. Because I'm always going to ask you, what's the conversation? What are you telling yourself about this? So you could, first thing you should do, if you feel inclined and this episode resonates with you, is go to vasavikumar.com and order my book. And then check out my Bold Voice training program. We start August 3rd. Um, and it's a six-month program. And I want to be very clear. It is not a coaching program. It is a training program, which means, listen, you do not need to be coached anymore. You need to be trained. You need to practice using your voice. In all of my groups, I don't do the talking anymore. You're doing the talking. I have no problem saying it out loud. I wrote a book about it. Y'all have y'all need to learn how to say it out loud. So my programs have really have more of a training vibe, practice vibe. You practice in front of people. That's really important because so many of the people who come to me want to be speakers, want to be leaders, want to facilitate large groups. You don't just wake up one day learning how to do that. You got to practice. So all my groups have practice practice. We're doing this out loud in front of other people. Make mistakes out loud. All my clients, all my group members know, I want you to grow out loud. I want you to make mistakes out loud. I want you to release the shame of looking like an idiot. It's fine if you look like an idiot. You're not an idiot. At least you're doing the damn thing. An idiot would be someone who didn't even take a chance on themselves. That's idiotic. You're actually putting yourself out there and you're making those mistakes. That's brave. So consider joining my Bold Voice training program. You can also find that over at my website, VasaviKumar.com. I also love Instagram. So come to my Instagram at my name is Vasavi and tag us, Kate and Indra and me. And uh, if, you, if you love this episode and share it to your stories. Vasavi, thank you so much. I, I'm i so excited. And um, thank you for putting saying out loud out into the world. Thank you for having me. I love you so much. Me too. Bye. Bye.